Well, hello and welcome to uh, another of my fireside chats uh, in the Vita series. Uh, this time I'm going to be looking at the professional Vita of uh, Dr. Robert Simon. He's a forensic psychologist in the family courts and um, a prominent forensic psychologist. And I'll be looking at um, a broad scale of Vitas uh, in the family courts, both to uh, help attorneys, family law attorneys, uh, understand better how to cross-examine mental health testimony, um, but also to uh, assist parents in understanding uh, what's in the family courts, who's in the family courts, um, and how to read a professional vita. Many parents um, are in a position of representing themselves pro se because uh, they can't afford the attorneys and the high costs of the custody battles. And so the ability to read um, a professional vita is, will be to um, the advantage of both um, the parents who are in the family courts, the consumers, as well as uh, family law attorneys in understanding how to cross-examine mental health testimony. So I'll be going through a broad array of, of vitas of people in the family courts and um, helping parents and attorneys and everyone in general understand who's in the family courts and how to read a professional vita. Um, the, our vitas are like our uh, calling card for a psychologist or for professional. They tell who we are and our backgrounds. So it's a valuable skill to have. And Dr. Simon's vita is up on his, his website. Um, I'm sure he uses it to promote his practice because that's what our vitas are there for to a certain extent to uh, demonstrate uh, the quality of our professional services. Um, and so you can go to his website and it's on Meet Dr. Simon, that particular page of his website. So beginning with Dr. Simon, uh, he's a prominent forensic psychologist and probably one of the, the top ones based on his vita and, and experience here. Uh, he's written two books uh, or two editions of the same book with uh, Dr. Stahl one in 2013 and then the second edition in 2020 uh, entitled Forensic Psychology Consultation in Child Custody Litigation, a Handbook for Work Product Review, Case Prep, uh, Preparation and Expert Testimony published by the American Bar Association. And so uh, in terms of forensic psychologists in the family courts, Dr. Simon uh, would be likely to be one of the, the top forensic psychologists uh, currently in the family courts. So uh, looking, starting with Dr. Simon's Vita, he starts off with his licenses held and he holds three licenses, uh, one in the state of California, a second one in Hawaii, and then a marriage and family therapist license that's currently inactive. Uh, the uh, let's see. So his he then moves on to his education and degrees. Uh, so he earned his doctorate degree in clinical psychology from California School of Professional Psychology in San Diego in 1986. So he's been in the family courts as a forensic psychologist for about 35 years. And a second entry is for a master's degree from the same California School of Professional Psychology. And what that is, is it's one degree, it's the doctorate degree, but CSPP, California School of Professional Psychology, I believe it's now called Alliant University, um, they give their students a master's degree halfway through, but it's moving towards the doctorate degree. That allows the um, second year students to then work under the master's degree. Um, so it's a like, a selling point to the university. I thought about applying to CSPP back when I was looking at um, graduate schools. I chose Pepperdine. This is a CSPP is a professional school, and there I just prefer a university-based doctoral program. I thought Pepperdine was a little stronger, and and they are very strong. So that's kind of the first two entries are kind of one entry. He got his doctorate degree out of CSPP in San Diego. Prior to that, he got a master's degree in child psychology, and that's something important to recognize. 
clinical psychology is the people who are licensed and working with families and doing therapy and diagnosis. Other branches of uh, professional degrees in psychology are not licensed and they're not clinical. So experimental psychology, or in this case, child psychology, that doesn't qualify you to become licensed um, typically. Um, it's only a degree in clinical psychology will then allow you to get the internships and postdocs and licenses going forward. Um, and then he graduated with a BA in um, psychology at a University of California, San Diego. That's, that's a strong university, mid-level UC uh, system. It's not Berkeley or UCLA, but it, it's you know, not Santa Cruz either. So it's, it's a mid-level strong university and graduating summa cum laude, uh, he studies well. So one of the things, though, I want to teach parents about uh, reading a Vita is you can actually sort of construct the story of the person's life by tracking their Vita and their, their um, education and job. So here we have, it looks like, from, based on his Vita, that Dr. Simon is based in San Diego, um, may have a second home out in uh, Hawaii, accounting for a dual license in, in that respect. But um, he comes out of San Diego, got his bachelor's degree, and then went to the University of Minnesota Institute of Child Development. And that's a strong, University of Minnesota has got a strong psychology program and child psychology is strong, but it's not leading towards licensing. So perhaps he was thinking he would um, get a teaching position in something about children or, um, and so it chose a good university um, for that. But it appears that after two years and getting his master's degree, he actually wanted, probably wanted to do more clinical work and actually get involved. Perhaps he got interested in forensic psychology around that point um, and then went back to the doctorate degree uh, in uh, clinical psychology so he could become licensed and, and work in the, the family courts. The But now in terms of his Vita and his education, I would kind of toss off that second master's degree. That's subsumed under the doctorate degree. They're both from the same university. It's a non-terminal program. It's shooting for the, the doctorate degree. So um, basically, he's got a doctorate degree in clinical psychology, a master's degree in child psychology, and then a bachelor's degree in psychology. He moves on then to his work experience. And the top listing from 1987 until now. So we look back for a second to his, he graduated in 1986. And so he immediately went into private practice, uh, independent private practice of forensic psychology, forensic consulting, child custody evaluations, and all the various aspects of forensic psychology, expert witness testimony, and so forth. Um, one of the features about that private practice is you're not working with other people. So you're not getting any input from you know, colleagues and you're not working as part of a treatment team or any sort of team approach. It's very isolative. Um, so you're working in your office, people come in to see you and forensic custody evaluations, you're just doing your custody, you're meeting with people and doing your thing on a custody evaluation and nobody ever reviews it or giving you feedback on it or anything, they're sealed by the court. So it's a very isolative position uh, and that's something to recognize. And the other thing is if people who are in independent practice as forensic psychologists, they haven't been hired by anybody. And so that's one of the things you'll also want to look for at Avita. You know, who's hired this person um, at, at, at various points in their career? So then he lists some additional positions. So for a year, he was uh, faculty for um, the Trial Advocacy Institute, uh, the American Bar Association Trial College for Family Law in Boulder, Colorado. That's interesting in 2014 and 15. So he's located out in San Diego, but he's a faculty for a very specific um, college uh, associated that's over in the legal section of things. So that's a, uh, my, my guess is he was teaching courses on forensic custody evaluation. He wasn't teaching courses in you know, 
uh, diagnosis and treatment or psychopathology or um, uh, you know, any uh, research methodology, those sorts of things. So he's a very much a forensic evaluator here. Then for a while, he was uh, a custody, child custody mediator in San Diego. Now, I would look at that as a lower level position than a doctorate a degree in clinical psychology. A custody mediator is kind of a lower level position. So again, I wouldn't give much stock to that position other than he has a doctorate degree in clinical psychology. And so he should make for a, a fairly good mediator of interpersonal conflict if you have a doctorate degree in psychology. Then um, way back 20 years ago, uh, when he was first kind of getting going, um, he was a, a volunteer position as a director for dispute resolution services. So he was uh, there for a couple of years. That's interesting. It was a volunteer position. Um, and so, but then it was also a long time ago and it, it's all subsumed within the forensic uh, domain here. So there's no indications he's worked with ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder in the school system. He's been very focused on uh, the family courts um, based on his work experience up till now. Then we move into his postdoctoral fellowship, which is supervised training. So at this point, it's not really um, work experience, it's supervised training experience. So the entire, and the, from 19, uh, 86 to 87, so this year of postdoctoral supervised training. Um, and to get a doctorate degree in California, you need one year of supervised pre-doctoral internship and one year of supervised postdoctoral uh, supervised training um, and for hours, and then you submit and you can sit for the licensing exam. So here is his year of postdoctoral uh, supervised training. But then that means that this work experience is the entirety of his work experience. Um, he worked in, as a private practice psychologist, as a forensic psychologist, and that's all he's done for 35 years with a slight minor little positions here and there, but nothing of notable substance. The... Um, in, and so his, uh, yeah, his postdoctoral fellowship was at Sharp Mesa Hospital. So he did his postdoc at a hospital, um, Child Adolescent Treatment Center in San Diego. Um, and you look at the what he did, it was a substance abuse recovery and psych testing in a locked inpatient facility. So he's working in a locked inpatient psychiatric facility um, it appears to be with substance abusing adolescents doing maybe some psych testing and, and group psychotherapy uh, related to that. And that was his year of postdoctoral training. Um, prior to that, uh, he was a psychology fellow. Now, here it's interesting because he doesn't say postdoctoral fellow. And typically that would be what we call a postdoctoral fellow, year of internship, year of postdoctoral fellowship. But he calls it a postdoctoral fellow from 85 to 86. And he got his doctorate degree in 86. He, and if we go back and look for a second, uh, yeah, his degrees from 83, he, and so he got his master's in two years, 83. He should have graduated in 85, um, but he didn't. And so what likely happened is he finished his um, pre-doctoral internship down there, 84 to 85, and should have graduated at 85, got his degree. Um, but then he probably didn't have his dissertation finished at that point. And so he finished his dissertation and got his doctorate degree in 1986, and but in the interim worked as a, you know, with this uh, Southwood Psychiatric Residential Treatment Center again. So uh, in substance abuse recovery. And then his pre-doctoral internship was with the Veterans Administration, which is 
kind of a, a standard internship a lot of places veterans administration hires a lot of interns um, so that's one of the kind of standard internships that you can get uh, apa uh, uh, approved or credited um, but that's working with veterans okay and that's not really relevant to children or child and family therapy and stuff and again this psychology fellowship during that year was in substance abuse recovery in a residential treatment program it appears he finished his um, his uh, doctorate, got a doctorate degree, then got a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, another residential treatment center uh, on substance abuse. So that's the way you can kind of look at the situation, look at the um, entries, and kind of begin to construct how the person arrived at where uh, they are and where is their background training. Um, and then his uh, Vita goes, uh, just by example, um, before we continue with this Vita, here's, for my Vita, here's the postdoctoral entries, or the, uh, my training experience entries. Um, so I have a year of pre-doctoral internship at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, that's a strong um, internship. That's uh, it's a, it's a uh, university-affiliated program, which is uh, substantial. It's associated with the USC Keck School of Medicine, um, and so that's it's a strong uh, children. It's a strong internship, and then I did two years of postdoctoral fellowship. Now, if you look at, at Dr. Simon's uh, uh, postdoctoral. It, that's a year because you only need a year for license, a year worth of supervised. But you see, I did two years at Children's Hospital. And the reason is because Children's Hospital is of such a, a high quality in their training that they require you commit to two years of training. They say, if you're going to come here, we need two years to train you. So you're going to have to give us two years. If you just want to get your year and get licensed, go somewhere else. If you want to get high quality training, you then you're going to commit two years to Children's Hospital. And I wanted the high quality training. So that's what I did and focus on ADHD, spina bifida. And one of the reasons for I chose Children's Hospital Los Angeles is to focus on early childhood mental health. And so you can kind of see there the, the difference in training background between that and uh, working at a inpatient facility or residential treatment facility, working with kids uh, in substance abuse. Yes, it's supervised. Yes, you get training, but there's different calibers of training um, that you can uh, look at. So then he goes on in his, uh, his Vita uh, listing his pre-doctoral placements. Uh, we call them practicum placements. They're, they're part, it's what you do. It's your very first clinical application while you're still in the doctorate program. So you'll notice that each um, well, the first one, the registered psych assistant in 1983 to 86. So 83 is when he got his master's degree. And so as soon as he got that, he started working as a registered psych assistant for Linda Eaton in San Diego, probably to make some money seeing clients under her license. So she's, she's supervising him. They are technically her clients that she is treating through Dr. Simon during that period. Um, and then, but before that, it's 83 to 84, one year um, of an intern. We call them practicum placements. Typically, internship is reserved for the pre-doctoral internship and then the postdoctoral fellowship is how we call them. So this would be a psychology um, practicum placement. Jewish Family Services in San Diego doing general uh, counseling sort of stuff. And then the California Psychological Service Center, probably doing testing. Um, my uh, practicum placements were at uh, Pacific Clinics doing testing, uh, then uh, Catholic Charities, similar to the Jewish Family Services, doing some sort of broad scale counseling, and then at the Pepperdine uh, Counseling Clinic. And so those were my practicum experience. But you don't see them listed on my Vita because they're just, they're, they get course credit for them. There's a practicum course credit, and, and you go out and get various uh, placements uh, before you get your doctor, before your internship and things. So these are a pretty low level 
um, training uh, placements. And that's it. Okay, that's that's the sum total of his uh, professional experience. So as I look at his vita, I would say we really are looking at basically one position. He, from 1987, 35 years from the moment he got his doctorate degree, he's been in independent private practice of forensic psychology, a couple uh, unnotable uh, positions a year um, at some legal college teaching forensic psychology likely uh, dispute resolution services as a volunteer so again in the forensic field um and then fact and then the custody mediator which is like a lower lower level position uh, than a doctor would be anticipated to fill and so i would i would just tend to just discount those and look at uh, the primary position, what he's done for the last 35 years is, is one position. And notable about that is he hasn't been hired by a lot of people. So he's getting court referrals that are kind of mandated to come in and he does his child custody evaluation thing. And that's what he's done for 35 years and written two books on how to, how to do custody evaluations. And all the supervised training is, is not particularly relevant. It's not work experience. Uh, I wouldn't look at it that way um, until you get licensed, until you're working independently. And then we look at, at what you've done to see where you're experienced. What type of populations have you worked with? So uh, reviewing his work experience, um, I would be worried about competence, standard 2.01, uh, boundaries of competence in four domains. I'd, I'd be worried about um, delusional thought disorders. I don't see any background in the diagnostic assessment or treatment of delusional thought disorders. And that's the pathology we have in the family courts. Typically that comes out of um, psychotic domains, schizophrenia. So we'd want to see something, an entry on his vita somehow having to do with assessing uh, psychotic level patients. Um, attachment pathology. There's nothing on his vita that indicates any sort of background education or training or experience in attachment pathology. Typically that comes from early childhood mental health um, or in the foster care system, something like that. No indication of child abuse or complex trauma uh, experience in his background or substance abuse, but not child abuse and complex trauma. And the pathology in the family courts is clearly within that domain. We got the allied parent and child making often making allegations of abusive parenting by the targeted parent and the differential diagnosis is potential child psychological abuse by the allied parent so we'd want to see some entry about having experience working with child abuse and complex trauma and family systems this is a, a family conflict we'd want to see some background in working with family systems bowen mnuchin haley madonis that genre uh, or that school of professional psychology. So the ethical code that's of concern is boundary 2.01, uh, or standard 2.01 boundaries of competence, that psychologists provide services, teach and conduct research with populations and in areas, and that's in areas, only within the boundaries of their competence based on their education, training, supervised experience, consultation, study, or professional experience. So that would be the, the primary concern as I look at his Vita, where did he acquire um, his education, training, and experience in those domains of pathology, which are relevant in the family courts? Um, first off, just relative to attachment and child abuse pathology, um, a child rejecting a parent is an attachment pathology. That's a problem in the love and bonding system of the brain, the attachment system. So as a result, the professional working with an attachment pathology needs to be competent in the diagnostic assessment and treatment of attachment pathology. So that's a requirement of standard 2.01. And then child abuse, because the only cause of severe attachment pathology, a child rejecting a parent, is child abuse range parenting by one parent or the other. And so competence in the diagnostic assessment and treatment of child abuse pathology would be required um, by standard 2.01 for work with the pathology in the family courts. 
And then for as for delusional thought disorders, that's clearly of relevance um, to work in the family courts. And I will cite to Walters and Friedlander writing in the journal Family Court Review, which is the flagship journal of the Association of uh, Family and Conciliation Courts, uh, AFCC, uh, the professional organization for forensic psychology and family law attorneys. And so in their flagship journal, Walters and Friedlander state, in some RRD families resist refuse dynamic, a parent's underlying encapsulated delusion about the other parent is at the root of the intractability. An encapsulated delusion is a fixed circumscribed belief that persists over time and is not altered by evidence of the inaccuracy of the belief. Heck, that sentence kind of cracks me up because the standard phrase, if you're working with delusions, is it's a fixed and false belief maintained despite contrary evidence. That's not Dr. Childress saying that. That's just how we, that's just how it's described if you're working in, in delusional thought disorders. A fixed and false belief maintained despite contrary evidence. But it appears here that Walters and Friedlander may not quite realize that's kind of a standard description. So they don't want to plagiarize. So they kind of move words around to, to say it in a different way. Um, you know, not altered by evidence of the inaccuracy of the belief, maintained despite contrary evidence. Um, but but they mention it. See, it's a delusion. They go on to state that when alienation is a predominant factor in the RRD resist refuse dynamic, um, the theme of the favored parents' fixed delusion often is that the rejected parent is sexually, physically, and or emotionally abusing the child. And the child may come to share the parent's encapsulated delusion and to regard the beliefs as his or her own. So here we have in the family court review, we have four references by Walters and Friedlanders saying this is a potential persecutory delusion. And so clearly, um, forensic psychologists who are working with a persecutory delusion need to be competent in the diagnostic assessment and treatment of a persecutory delusion, shared, uh, encapsulated, shared persecutory delusion. Um, and so that should be obvious to all forensic psychologists. It's in your forensic psychology journal. Um, and so, again, to give you an example of what Avita should look like, regarding it should, you should be able to see demonstration of each area of necessary competence. So for example, for my Vita, delusional thought disorders, I was a research associate, associate for like 12 years at a UCLA longitudinal research project on schizophrenia. And I was receiving annual training in the diagnostic assessment of psychotic symptoms and delusions using the brief psychiatric rating scale um, in addition to managing all aspects of the, the research, uh, data collection and data processing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so there, you know, I have 12 years experience directly on um, assessing delusional thought disorders. Now, I wouldn't anticipate most VITAs would, would look like that. My VITA is particularly strong. But you want to see some level of working with bipolar patients, schizophrenic patients, working with delusional thought disorders in some way, psychotic patients in some way. And I'm not seeing that. I'm, I'm seeing that he worked with substance abuse and then he went into private practice. And if you look at, you know, seminars taken or continuing education later in his vita, there's no indication he ever received any training in delusional thought disorders or the assessment of that. So I worry about that. And you, But you should see something documenting that on a professional vita. Um, then also for child abuse and attachment, I was a clinical director for a pediatric neurodevelopmental assessment and treatment center run by the California State University at San Bernardino through their Institute of Child Development and Family Relations. And we, there were actually three universities involved. Loma Linda provided faculty and trainees in occupational therapy. Um, University of Redlands provided faculty and trainees in speech and language, and then Cal State provided the psychology component, faculty and student trainees, as well as the clinical staff. 
and I was in charge of the whole thing. So I'm the clinical director of that. And so there's, a, again, a difference between working as part of a treatment team. We're getting, um, it's an early childhood assessment and treatment center for children ages zero to five in foster care. And so I'm, I'm leading treatment teams uh, that include CPS, uh, Child Protective Services was our primary referral source, kids in foster care. And children in foster care, ages three to five, those are both spot on attachment pathology. Being in foster care and being um, age zero to five, plus being in foster care, that's all about child abuse. So I have personally treated all four types of child abuse. I led the treatment teams with CPS involvement for all four types of child abuse, physical, sexual, neglect, and psychological. So again, that's some, that's, you see it documented, the, the professional um, competence in this domain based on your experience, education, and training. So this would be, this would be experience on that. Again, I don't expect to see the entries being this high, but if you were working as a therapist at this clinic, that would demonstrate that you have competence working with child abuse and attachment pathology and training in that. That's what I used to do was train the clinical staff in, in, in this. So if you have an entry, entry in that, uh, working with either zero to five or foster care or uh, child abuse and complex trauma. In addition, just to look at attachment pathology, again, what, what you should see on a VITA, um, potentially. And so uh, my VITA I certification out of Field and Graduate Institute in parent-infant mental health. That's interesting. Doing psychotherapy with an infant? My goodness. And so um, you know, parent-infant, that's attachment pathology. Um, then I know two different diagnostic systems for early childhood, the DC-0, zero, uh, zero to three uh, revised that is stronger with um, attachment pathology and diagnosing that. And then the DMIC diagnostic uh, manual for infancy and early childhood, which is stronger that, at diagnosing autism spectrum pathology. Um, and so these are different diagnoses. You have the DSM-5 and then, but these are more appropriate for early childhood. DSM-5 is not good for that. Um, and then I know two early childhood treatments for attachment treatments. Um, watch, wait, and wonder, which is for the infant age range, and then circle of security, which is for preschooler age range. So there's your attack. That's what it, a VITA should look like in terms of support for knowing attachment pathology, complex trauma, and um, child abuse. It, maybe not at this level, um, but we should see some indication uh, of background in attachment pathology. Um, so relative to cross-examining mental health uh, testimony, uh, what the sort of the series of questions I would recommend for attorneys, um, and, and this Dr. Simon's Vita is going to be one of the, the top Vitas in forensic psychology, and you can see where it's just kind of thin. He's only been a private practice psychologist with no evidence of any uh, attachment or delusional thought disorders or family systems or um, you know, complex trauma and child abuse. There's no evidence of any work experience relative to those. Um, so the typical question I, uh, I recommend attorneys ask in this domain um, is to ask the forensic psychologist, is the APA ethics code mandatory or optional? It's mandatory. It's required. Um, read standard 2.01 boundaries of competence, what we just went over, based on education, uh, training, and experience. Do you agree with standard 2.01 of the APA Ethics Code? Yes. Do you abide by standard 2.01 of the APA Ethics Code? This is going to be an interesting question for them because um, kind of no, <laughs> they, they don't, they're not competent in multiple domains of psychology that's the concern um and so but they'll say yes because they're not going to admit that they're not they don't abide by the you know api ethics code so then ask them why is standard 2.01 important ask them to explain that what bad things would happen if standard 2.01 was violated why is it mandatory 
And essentially, it's because if you're not competent, we're going you're going to misdiagnose the pathology, and then you're going to wind up mistreating the pathology. You're going to treat cancer with insulin because you're not competent in the diagnosis of the cancer. And so uh, get them to explain that for you. Why is it mandatory? What's the importance of standard 2.01? And what, ha what bad things happen if you violate it? And so I would, I would kind of set them up with those questions. And then follow up with the specific, more specific questions, uh, which are, show us on your Vita where you acquired your professional training and experience in the diagnostic assessment of delusional thought disorders. So show us on your Vita where you got that, that training um, and have them explain it. That should be an interesting question for opposed to Dr. Simon. Um, then same thing with attachment. Show us on your Vita where you acquired your professional training and experience in the diagnostic assessment and treatment of attachment pathology. Another interesting question for Dr. Simon. And then uh, finally, uh, show us on your Vita where you acquired your training and experience in the diagnostic assessment and treatment of child abuse and complex trauma. And you can do personality disorders, family systems, but I, I would typically stop at those three uh, because any one of them, they are practicing beyond the boundaries of their competence. And typically the forensic psychologists will have none of them. Uh, I'm not seeing that on Dr. Simon's Vita and he's the best in forensic psychologist has, uh, forensic psychology has. So uh, he's one of their best and I'm not seeing where on his Vita where these criteria have been met, but he can answer for himself where, where he developed his competence in these things. Um, interestingly though, that's the whole sum of his professional experience. Um, he then goes on to a little section um, talking about experience and skills, which seems a little redundant. He just told us his experience and his skills are in forensic psychology. That's, but he, he goes on to say, uh, the forensic, he's a forensic psychologist, and he's been licensed for over 30 years. He's been doing forensic psychology and lists all the forensic psychology stuff he does. Um, that looks to me as though it's very thin. He does forensic custody evaluations, and that's pretty much it. And he confirms that in his final statement here, which is practice limited to forensic psychology consulting in family law related matters, which means he's basically saying, I'm not competent in anything else other than custody evaluations. I'm not competent in attachment pathology. I'm not competent in delusional thought disorders. I'm not competent in family systems. I'm not competent in um, child abuse and trauma, which is what the pathology is in the family courts. So I got concerns just based on him kind of acknowledging he's not competent in a number of stuff. He's been in private practice. He hasn't worked with anything, any other pathology that I can see. And if you look at his you know, continuing education credits, they're all in forensic psychology. He's not going out and getting anything else. So I have concerns uh, relative to standard 2.01. Um, and then he goes on to the rest of his VITA. Um, and he has professional affiliations, 12 organizations. Um, he joins a lot of things. That's all it kind of means. It's not really relevant or of value. You can join stuff. It doesn't mean anything. Um, the, uh, I, if you look at my Vita, I have two. Uh, I have American Psychological Association. I just keep that just because, you know, people like to see that on my, my Vita, the member of the APA. But it doesn't do me any good. Um, I had a postdoc once. Uh, you know, he, he graduated, got his license, and he didn't join the APA. I said, I said you didn't join the APA? Because I always joined it because we, we were doing a lot of presentations at various places. And that's why you join so you can uh, you know, present to the, um, the national conventions and stuff. So it's, it's useful for early career psychologists um, doing that. And, um, and he said, I said, you didn't join the APA. He says, no, I don't see that they do have any benefit for me. And it struck me. I went, wow, wait a minute. <laughs> you're right. They, they, they really don't have any benefit other than if you're presenting at the national conventions or, or you know, you want to get a discount on your auto insurance or something. But, um, but really, in, as a clinical psychologist, it's about being licensed. 
So if you're licensed, that's all you need, you know, and the, but I keep the APA up. I've been a member of the AFCC off and on. Um, I don't like the AFCC. I think they're a problematic professional organization. Um, I joined them like when I presented to the national convention um, with Dorsey, I joined for that. Um, and I, I think I joined one other time early on just to kind of see what, what was up with them. But now I, I'm not a member of AFCC, even though I work in the family courts. Um, and the other um, professional organization affiliation I put up there is the National Register of Health Service Psychologists. That is an organization that pre-certifies your credentials. So my postdoc supervision hours, my pre-doc supervision hours, my education degrees and everything, all of those um, documents, all of those uh, things, hours and everything have signed off, have been submitted to the National Register and they've checked them off and certified them. And like, and that allows for portability of license. So I can move my license to different states real easy because everything's been pre-certified. It's like getting pre-approved for a home loan, but it's pre-approved for moving my license from state to state. Um, and, and so it's the closest thing we have to a national license or international license. And so I'm, I have that as my um, due diligence. I'm trying to, you know, respect jurisdictions and I have my, my, I'm certified, my credentials are certified. So that's the National Register. So I have two listed. He's got, you know, 12 organizations. So he's kind of a joiner. Um, then recent publications, he has two pages. Um, looking through those, they are all opinion pieces. There's no research involved. So 35 years, and he hasn't done any research uh, in the family courts that I can see. Maybe maybe I missed something. Um, but he's got a lot of opinion pieces. And so that's, as you parents and attorneys read uh, Vita's, don't be intimidated by all the publications. Look for research. If they're just opinion pieces, it doesn't matter. And peer review only applies to research. It doesn't apply to opinion pieces. If I have an opinion that the parents in the family courts are Martians, and I submit my article accusing the parents of the, or hypothesizing that the parents in the family courts are Martians to the uh, Journal of Ancient Aliens, and the ancient alien experts uh, peer review my article and say, hey, that's possible, and publish it. I now have a peer-reviewed uh, article published in the Journal of uh, you know, Ancient Aliens uh, that the families in the family courts are Martians. Is it true? No. So it doesn't really matter. You know, you just got like-minded people who peer reviewed it and said, yeah, you agree with me. And, and so it's not true. But peer review has to do with its research. It's looking at the research methodology and whether that supports the conclusions made. Opinion pieces is irrelevant. So he's written, you know, two pages of opinions on recent publications. He's probably got more after that. So he's got a lot of opinions. That doesn't necessarily mean they're true opinions. Um, and then presentations and lectures, 18 pages, same thing. He's got a lot of opinions. It doesn't mean they're true opinions. Um, interestingly, um, he's got the July 2014, uh, or he's got, um, in July 2014, he did a presentation on direct and cross-examination of mental health experts in custody litigation, which is kind of what I'm doing with, with this Vita series. I'm, I'm kind of talking to family law attorneys about direct in cross-examination of mental health experts in custody litigation. So I'm kind of doing what he did back, back then as well. Um, and then the other interesting piece is move, he has then has eight pages of continuing education trainings attended. And if you look at them, they're all forensic custody evaluations. A lot of them are, you know, national conventions of the AFCC or various things. And, and um, that's, a little overboard, but it's all in forensic psychology. Um, and eight pages of that. But here again, June 2017 in Boston, that's where Dorsey and I went to present. So that entry, you know, Dorsey Pruder and Dr. Childress presenting at the AFCC and that whole thing um, was that convention. He was there. Um, 
<laughs> likely didn't attend my uh, seminar because um, that's where he would have learned about boundaries of competence and all these things. And I have uh, slides up on my website for that. Um, so that that's just kind of an interesting little overlap there. So again, going back to my Vita. Now, I'm a PsyD, a doctorate in psychology, not a PhD, not a philosophy doctor. And the difference is PsyDs sacrifice um, the coursework in research to get additional coursework in diagnosis and treatment. So we're stronger on the practical application side. So when you look at a PsyD Vita, you should see a lot of good work experience. That's where we'll be strong is work experience. And if you look at my Vita, that's where I'm strong. Um, you should not see any research because we don't work in universities. That's the PhDs. They get the research training and, and get pulled into university kind of researchers and also psychotherapy. But I do have um, published articles, but also opinion pieces on the Internet and stuff, but also actual research um, things. And so when you're looking at publications, don't worry about opinion pieces. Um, look for the research. And one of the ways you'll recognize research is when you see like a huge number of authors, holy cow, you know, 15 authors or whatever on something. That's a research study. Um, and so uh, to, to, I'm fourth author on that. And the reason I'm fourth author is because I'm the one who ran the project. Um, all the other people are people I worked with on that. And it's Clinical Neuroscience Research, strong article. Um, and it's on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in preschoolers. So it's outside of the family court stuff. I've worked with a lot of stuff. And service before diagnosis. I think that could be brought over here very well. Um, doing treatment or service before we actually diagnose the pathology, early intervention. And then I have another research study um, that Greenham, Childress, and Pruder um, is up on ResearchGate. Dark Personalities and Induced Delusional Disorder, Part 3, Identifying Pathogenic Parenting Underlying a Crisis in the Family and Domestic Violence Courts. That's using Dorsey Pruder's custody resolution method data, her archival data. And um, uh, we took a look at that relative to the 12 associated clinical signs I proposed and uh, found that they are present and uh, substantially present, um, which goes to support that the model that developed those hypotheses for the 12 associate clinical signs is accurate. I made a prediction, the prediction was found in the data, um, the model that made the prediction is accurate. So I actually have two actual research. And Dorsey, interestingly, Dorsey Pruder, who's a businesswoman and family coach, actually has research in the family courts uh, based on her data. She, it's her data from the custody resolution method and so she's actually got a stronger publication and research beta than Dr. Simon does, at least once this gets published. Uh, she'll have a stronger beta than he does because he doesn't have any research. It's all opinion pieces. Um, I find it interesting. So, um, again, um, looking at the uh, continuing education that I have up on my beta, I have seminar, recent seminars taken. So I have the Advanced Master Program on the Treatment of Trauma from the National Institute for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine, 12 hours on that. Complex Trauma, Bessel van der Kolk, Body Keep Score, Intensive Training in Trauma Treatment, Dialectic Behavior Therapy, you know, Intensive Training. And so I'm, I'm getting training in the type of pathology that we have in the family courts. Now, my Vita, I'm Clinical Director for a Children's Assessment Treatment Center for Kids in Foster Care. I know trauma and complex trauma, but I'm still taking additional uh, seminars in that, uh, partly as a role model, partly to say people need to, to do this. And then the other ones I list are emotionally focused therapy. That's um, an attachment-based couples therapy. So I took uh, an intensive course in emotionally focused therapy. And then the Bowen Center, a three-day seminar in the emotional cutoff, um, the 56th annual symposium on family theory and family psychotherapy. Dr. Pilmer was there out of Cornell, and he spoke about his research on family rifts and how to mend them, findings from the Cornell Estrangement and Reconciliation Project, which I did out John Hopkins. So 
that's like directly relevant family estrangement and reconciliation project. So again, he's doing research on this um, and out of Cornell and, and through family systems work. And so that that's the type of thing you'll want to see. Um, and but if you look at Simon's Vita, by contrast, you'll see a lot of forensic uh, continuing education. So again, he's very focused. So when he says he, he's limited to forensic custody evaluations, that, that appears to be quite true. Um, so basically, I can boil down, when I look at Dr. Simon's Vita, this is what it is. This is, he got 33 pages of Vita, but when I look at it, this is all that's like really of substance that I can, I can see. Um, so he got a doctorate degree in clinical psychology, has a master's degree and a bachelor's degree, but those are kind of subsumed up under the doctorate degree. Um, and then he's worked as a private practice psychologist doing custody evaluations for 35 years. And that's kind of it. And I'm not seeing any experience uh, anywhere else uh, with any other aspect of the pathology. So let's take a look at what forensic custody evaluator evaluations are. Uh, so this was an independent review from the New York Blue Ribbon Commission on Forensic Custody Evaluations. Um, so if he's been doing them for 30 years, 35 years, let's take a look at what an independent review says he's been doing. So from the New York Blue Ribbon Commission on Forensic Custody Evaluations, ultimately the commission members agree that some New York judges order forensic evaluations too frequently and often place undue reliance on them. Judges order forensic evaluations to provide relevant information regarding the best interests of children, and some go far beyond an assessment of whether either party has a mental health condition that has affected their parental behavior. In their analysis, evaluators may rely on principles and methodologies of dubious validity in some custody cases because of a lack of evidence or the inability of parties to pay for expensive challenges of an evaluation, defective reports can thus escape meaningful scrutiny and are often accepted by the court with potentially disastrous consequences for parents and children. Oh my, this is what he's been doing for 35 years, you know, potentially disastrous consequences, what he teaches other people to do. By an 11-9 margin, a majority of commission members favor elimination of forensic custody valuations entirely. So Dr. Simon's entire career in forensic psychology, uh, it's being an independent review said we should get rid of the entire thing. And for my position, reviewing these custody valuations as a consultant in the family courts, I'm in 100% agreement. Um, the elimination of forensic custody valuations entirely arguing that these reports are biased, they're harmful to children, and lack scientific or legal value. So what Dr. Simon's been doing for 35 years is harmful to children, it lacks scientific and legal value, and um, at worst, evaluations can be dangerous, uh, particularly in situations of domestic violence and child abuse. Wow. Um, so that's what he's been doing and that's what he recommends and teaches other people to do. Um, these members reached the conclusion that the practice is beyond reform and that no amount of training for courts, forensic evaluators, or other court personnel will successfully fix the bias, inequity, and conflict of interest issues that exist within the system. Well, uh, maybe Dr. Simon should be starting to get competent in something else because it looks like his career path is maybe vanishing on him based on the independent review of the New York Blue Ribbon Commission that found that what he does and recommends and teaches to others is of dubious validity, uh, produces defective reports that lead to potentially da disastrous consequences for parents and children, that they're harmful to children, that they lack scientific and legal value, that they're dangerous, and that the practice is beyond reform. Yikes for Dr. You know, Simon. So here's the thing. If Dr. Simon has benefited from this thing that he's created with his colleagues, this experimental approach to service delivery called forensic psychology, they have benefited for 35 years 
um, as being a big expert and you know, traveling all over the world presenting and you know, got a home in San Diego and potentially in Hawaii. And so, so he's benefiting from this forensic custody evaluators, evaluations that are of dubious validity, harmful to children, lack scientific and legal value. I think then he should also be held responsible when it, the, the, the model that he and his colleagues developed proves to be um, substantially problematic. So that's interesting. We'll, we'll see what happens off of that. Um, the APA Ethics Code, just to start wrapping up here. Um, I have obligations. The APA Ethics Code is mandatory. And my obligations are under standard 1.04, informal re resolution of ethical violations. When psychologists believe that there may have been an ethical violation by another psychologist, that's kind of a low bar. We believe that there may have been an ethical violation by another psychologist. They attempt to resolve the issue by bringing it to the attention of that individual. If an informal resolution seems appropriate and doesn't violate confidentiality rights. Um, so it looks like that's kind of maybe active for me um, because um, I, it appears that doctor, based on the review of the VITA, there's concerns about boundary 2.01, boundaries of competence based on his education training experience relative to the diagnostic assessment of delusional thought disorders. I'm not seeing it. Relative to the diagnostic assessment of child abuse and complex trauma, I'm not seeing it. And relative to the diagnosis, uh, a diagnostic assessment of attachment pathology, I'm not seeing it on his vita. And so where did he acquire the competence to be working with the pathology that he's working with? Because that's the pathology. It's attachment pathology. It's a delusional thought disorder and it's child abuse and complex trauma. Also, standard 2.04, basis for scientific and professional judgments. That psychologist's work is based on the established scientific and professional knowledge of the discipline, which is attachment and family systems and personality disorders, child abuse and complex trauma, and DSM-5 diagnostic system, persecutory delusions. That's the established knowledge. That's the knowledge he is required to apply as the basis for his professional judgments. And I'm not even sure that he knows this knowledge. He says he's limited to forensic psychology, and that's pretty much all he knows. Well, then I worry about this um, standard as well. Um, in a, addition, there's standard 2.03, maintaining competence, that psychologists undertake ongoing efforts to develop and maintain their competence. And he says right on his Vita that his practice is, in 35 years, his practice is limited to forensic psychology, consulting, and family law related matters. So he's acknowledging that. He's just like a one thing person. He does child custody evaluations that have been reviewed by the New York Blue Ribbon Commission rather unfavorably. And that's the, the only thing he does. So I'm worried that he hasn't made on, he hasn't undertaken ongoing efforts to develop his competence, to take courses, to learn about attachment, to learn about delusional thought disorder, to learn about child abuse and complex trauma and personality disorder, dark personalities, all the stuff. So um, just Google ignorance, lack of knowledge or information. So he, from all appearances, he lacks knowledge or information about attachment, delusions, personality disorders, child abuse and trauma. So ignorant opinions are of no value. So, and I would suggest you know, Google indolence, avoidance of activity or exertion, laziness, why hasn't he acquired this knowledge? He just stayed in his one lane of the thing that makes him feel comfortable, which is forensic custody evaluations. Done that for 30 years, but hasn't expanded, hasn't made the effort to develop or even maintain his, his um, competence. Uh, then also 9.01, the psychologist basis for assessment. The psychologist based the opinions contained in their recommendations, reports, and diagnostic or evaluative statements, including forensic testimony, so they're talking to forensic psychologists, um, on information and techniques sufficient to substantiate their findings, see also 2.04. So they're citing right back to using the established knowledge, which is attachment, family systems, personality disorders, complex trauma, DSM diagnostic system, the delusional thought disorders, and factitious disorder imposed on another. And so his, 
it appears that it's not based. His, his professional judgments are not based on the established knowledge if he doesn't know the established knowledge. So um, the, I'm looking at multiple uh, ethical violations, 2.01, 2.03, 2.04, 2.0 or 9.01. If I believe they might <laughs> be uh, violated, um, I'm obligated under 1.04. 1.05. Uh, continues my obligations. If an apparent ethical violation has substantially harmed or is likely to substantially harm a person or organization, it is not appropriate for informal resolution under 1.04 or is not resolved properly in that fashion, such act, um, then psychologists take further action appropriate to the situation. Mm, What is that? They give some examples. Such action might include referral to a state or national committees on professional ethics, to state licensing boards, or to appropriate institutional authorities. Okay, so I'm required. These these are mandatory on my part. Um, And so we go going back just to close here until the New York Blue Ribbon Commission. So um, the idea that standard 1.05 sets the criteria of substantially harmed or is likely to substantially harm. We look to the New York Blue Ribbon Commission that 11 to nine margin, majority of commission members favor the elimination of forensic custody evaluations entirely, arguing that these reports are biased and harmful to children, lack scientific or legal value, at worst they can be dangerous. So harmful to children, dangerous, potentially disastrous consequences for parents and children. Um, I think that clause of 1.05, that they have substantially harmed children and families in the family courts and are, the custody evaluations, these forensic custody evaluations, and are likely to continue to substantially harm children and families in the family courts because of the multiple ethical violations. So standard 1.05 would also seem to be triggered, uh, at least that section of standard 1.05. And but 1.04 would seem to be clearly um, activated by my review of the Vita that when psychologists believe there may have been an ethical violation by another psychologist, there may have been. I'm looking at 2.04, 2.03, 2.01, and 9.01 of the APA Ethics Code, and uh, I have concerns. Um, and so I attempt to resolve the issue by bringing it to the attention of that individual. Well, there's my marching orders. Um, if that appears appropriate and doesn't violate any confidentiality issues involved. So I have concerns for 2.01, 2.03, 2.04, and 9.01 based on my review of Dr. Simon's Vita. And I would just close here by saying Dr. Simon is likely to be one of the top forensic psychologists. So, I mean, he's written a book, two couple of books that have been published by the American Bar Association on how to do these forensic evaluations that the Blue Ribbon Commission has so uh, um, harshly critiqued. Uh, So I've got ethical violations relative to to that. And, And if he's the top, then that means everybody else is not quite even at that his standard of practice. So um, there's just a broad scale concern. So that would be how I would, for um, family law attorneys, that's the domains that I would um, approach and uh, discuss uh, or cross-examine mental health testimony on. So that'll finish up Dr. Simon's Vita, a review of his Vita, and we'll take a look at another uh, Vita in the next in our series. So. Uh, Look forward to seeing you there and good luck, everybody.